Good morning. I want to thank you for joining us as we walk through the book of Revelation. It's going to challenge you. It's going to challenge me. We are seeing things that are beyond our ability to even fully comprehend. We trust what we see as the Lord unveils it and shows it to us. As we are continuing through the book of Revelation, we're in the third section now. We are looking ahead at those things that shall be, that will take place, that God has promised that He's going to do. He's bringing all of history to completion and giving us an eternal future. That's what we're seeing here in the book of Revelation. Chapter 4 and 5, we are stepping into that heavenly throne room setting. It is a prequel to what's coming in chapter 6. It is the basis for what's going to happen in chapter 6. It is, the, it is the culmination of what was given to the seven churches. It is the scene that wraps everything up. It is, it is about worship. It is about treasuring God more than anything else. That's really what worship is all about. And so the challenge to these seven churches has been to treasure Christ so much that he changes their life, that he has their allegiance, their will, their, their very life, that they follow after him, no matter the cost, believing the very promises of the Lord, experiencing the joy of the Lord, the relationship that they have in Christ. God is worthy. This is really the emphasis of these two chapters. God is worthy. And so what we're encountering here is a, is a theodicy of God. That's just a big word that just says it's a defense of God. God is, what he's doing here in these two chapters is he's setting the stage for what's about to come in chapter 6. We see that, we've understood that. God is, is giving us the privilege of seeing who he is, his attributes. He doesn't have to do this, but he's, he's justifying in a way why he is worthy to do what's about to take place. Why he is worthy to be the one to carry out, to fulfill, to unfold, to unleash, to unveil the riches, the blessings of promises to his children and the reality of judgment against those who are separated from him. Chapter 4 was about simply looking at God the Father. We have a relationship with, relationship with him through Christ. I trust you know him this morning. The scene in chapter 4 was, the focus was, and is worship, treasuring God, the Father, seeing Him in terms that are that are beyond us. What we saw there in chapter 4 specifically is that the Father is the creator of all things. Yes, Jesus Christ is very much a part of that. We see that throughout the New Testament. But the focal point here is God the Father. Now as we turn to chapter 5, the focal point is going to shift to God the Son. But we open up this chapter, we open up the beginning by still having that glimpse of the Father. For we're going to find that they are, of course, knit together, tied together, one in nature, one in essence. And so now as we focus on the Son, we first pick up uh, a glimpse of the Father here in chapter 5, verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him, that's the Father, who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on back, sealed with seven seals. What we see here is this. We're going to focus on the Son, but we have this first glimpse of the Father, but realizing the Son is going to be central to this passage, is here in this passage. We just haven't caught a glimpse of Him yet. What we see here, though, in, in, in chapter and in verse 1 is this. God the Father, He's on the throne. He has this seal. It's got seven seals. It shows to us that, that picture of completeness. It's the complete will of God. It is written on... On the back, on the front, it is completely filled. Nothing is to be added to this. God's perfect will is now going to be unveiled. There's nothing more that will be added. It will simply now be implemented. It will simply now be applied to the human race and to history. The revelation is complete. Now it is unfolding. And that's what we see here. No one is able to... To open that scroll we're going to see what we see here though really by connection is Jesus Christ he is he is one with the father the father is on the throne but the key here as we look at the scrolls is not only what Jesus is going to do we're going to talk about the scrolls in just a second but who Jesus is that is important as well he is one with the father that's why it's so important he is worthy of all worship because this is true. Jesus made that clear. When he ministered here on earth, he simply said, I and the Father are one. He couldn't make it any clearer than that. Colossians chapter 2 reminds us that all of the deity, all of the essence, all of the nature of who God is, 
resided in, dwelt in, defined Jesus Christ while he was here on earth and certainly before he came and after he has ascended. This is the very essence of who Jesus is. He is deity. He is God. <clears throat> we could go to many other places, but we just suffice it to say that this is true. And so Jesus Christ here in chapter 5 that we're going to see is one with the Father. One God, three persons. He is worthy. He is worthy. We move on as we continue here in chapter 5, verse 2, And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or even to look into it. The Son is worthy, we see from, from these verses here, not specifically, but coming in this chapter and coming from the ministry of Jesus Christ simply is this. The scrolls, the scrolls are significant. They're going to control the narrative that's going to unfold in chapter 6 and to follow. The scrolls are God's will. What is written in those scrolls is the very will of God for humanity. The very will of God for all eternity, really. Uh, the kingdom will come as these scrolls are ultimately unveiled and revealed. The scrolls contain the very wrath of God against sin, against people who have sinned, against humanity that stands in sin against him. But the scroll is more than that. The scroll is positive. The scroll is, is a deed. It's that eternal deed to all of the kingdom of God. It is being handed over, given to the person of Jesus Christ. The scroll is many things. It is the perfect will of God. Jesus Christ is fulfilling that, receiving that, implementing that. We're going to see how significant that is. The reality here is that Jesus Christ is worthy is because he is fulfilling the will of the Father. In his ministry here on earth, now here in Revelation, we're going to see how that's all tied together. John chapter 6, the Lord made it clear that he came to do the will of the Father. I've not come down from heaven to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, he agonized in his spirit. And he said, Father, if it's possible, as a human being, he says, is it possible to let this cup pass from me? But at the end of the day, at the end of that prayer, his soul was knit to his father's. But Father, your will, not mine, right? That's the key. John chapter 17. I glorified you on earth. I accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Jesus Christ fulfilled the will of God. He is here as well, fulfilling and carrying out, implementing the very will of God. And here's the second part of that verse, which is significant. It takes us here into this heavenly scene. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. He's not being given something that he didn't have. It has always been his. From eternity past, the glory of God has always belonged to Jesus Christ, for he's God. As he stands here, we're going to see in this chapter, not today, next week, as, we, as he stands here before the Father, he is one with the Father. He's carrying out the will of the Father. He is worthy of all worship. He has been obedient to the Father. But more than that, the promise of God is being fulfilled. Ask of me, this is, a, this is an intera interaction in Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, 8, 9, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Hebrews chapter 1, in the last days, the Father has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of, of everything, of all things, through whom, through Christ, he also created the world. Jesus created all things with the Father, with the Spirit of God, and is receiving all that creation unto himself for an eternal kingdom. He is worthy of all praise. He is worthy of worship. He is carrying out, fulfilling, receiving the end of the will of God. He is the will of God. He has honored the will of God, obeyed the will of God. Now he's carrying out the will of God. And then in verse 5, And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. 
Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. The Son of God is worthy. He is fulfilling prophecy. This verse shows us the fulfillment of prophecy being completed in Christ, in the person of Jesus Christ. Let's look at that. Let's see that. That's going to be important. We're going to spend our time here this morning on the fulfillment of these four verses applied in verse 5. It is Jesus Christ who now is, who is receiving, inheriting the cause and result. It is Jesus Christ who is now center stage. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. He will take center stage here. This prophecy begins in the Old Testament. It is a specific prophecy. It goes clear back into Genesis. We're going to see that this morning. It begins with Jacob. In Genesis, Jacob lost his wife. Through childbirth, their, their youngest son, she, she died in childbirth. Jacob would lose another son. He would be killed, Jacob thought. But then he would return alive. We know that's Joseph. We think of the agony, think of the emotional trauma that he went through experiencing these things. God knows our hurts. He knows the adversity. He knows the challenges. He knows the emotional things we go through. He was with Jacob. He's with you and I. 17 years later, after Joseph returns, now, now Jacob is old. He's frail. He's in bed. He's got one more task to do before the Lord is going to bring him home, before the Lord is going to bring an end to his life here on earth. One more thing to do. He's going to give words of finality over his, 12, over his sons. Words of prophecy over his sons. There's a lot to be said here. So it begins with Jacob, but the focal point is Judah. Why Judah? Well, you have Reuben, you have Simeon, you have Levi. They have lost their rights and privileges of the firstborn because of sin. But consequential, sin is so consequential in our life. It impacts us so much. We're all sinners. Their sin has been gravely consequential to them. They've lost that because of that. Now it comes to Judah. Judah is the fourth son. The question is, is Judah going to share in the same fate? The answer is no. Did Judah sin terribly, grievously against God as well? In spite of his sin, he reveals a, a tender heart to God regarding the episode of uh, Benjamin before Joseph. Jacob reveals his heart. Judah reveals his heart confesses, is tender, repentant, and God's going to bless that. We see a prophetic description applied to Jacob here, to Judah. Judah is a lion's cub, Genesis 49.9. We're going to come back to Genesis 49. He crouched as a lion, and as a lioness, who dares rouse him? It has a direct application as it passes through the scriptures here in Revelation. Judah is characterized as a lion's cub. Jesus here in verse 5 is described as the lion of Judah. He is, he is the fulfillment of all that begins here specifically in Genesis chapter 49. Judah is a lion's cub. That's how she's described. That's how he is described. Judah begins as a small tribe in Egypt. Joseph was there, blessed when Joseph was there, now living there. They're growing. As they grow, the Pharaoh enslaves them. They become a threat. They are enslaved. Judah is going to become the largest of the tribes. Judah is going to be the one who's going to lead Israel through the wilderness. When they leave, break encampment, and they march as a people, Judah is the one who's out front. But when their deliverer leads them out of, out of Egypt, it's not someone from, Ju from the tribe of Judah, it is Jacob, it is the tribe, it is Moses. He's from the tribe of Levi. We see that take place here. Israel, as it moves forward and comes into the promised land, is going to demand a king. God's going to give that king to them. It's going to be a, an act of discipline against Israel ultimately. That king is not from Judah, that king is from Benjamin. Where is Judah? Where is the line of Judah? What's happening in Israel? What's going on? This, this prophecy was given to Judah. Um, then David comes along. David, David represents really the glory days of Israel. Uh, David and Solomon in Jerusalem, the world coming to, to them, um, 
God's blessing upon them? Is David the Lion of Judah? We know the answer. The answer is no. David is a glimpse. David is a shadow. David is a foreshadowing of the Lion of Judah who is to come, who will fulfill the prophecy that's given to Judah here. In fact, after Solomon passes away, the kingdom is going to divide, and David's family is going to get the smaller part of that. Ten tribes will separate. Only two will remain. And then the kingdom will break up and the kingdom will fall apart. 586. They'll be conquered. They'll go into captivity. Seven years. Jerusalem will be destroyed. All that's going to take place. And afterwards, there's going to be no descendant on the throne. No king on the throne. No king on the throne from Judah. Families, David's family is going to appear to be prophetically, and we see this in Isaiah, to be a, a, a dead stump, a dead tree. And that brings us to verse 5 here in Revelation. Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. Jesus is described not only as the lion of Judah, but as the root of David. Verse 5. Jesus is a prophetic root from David. We see that. We see that in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch. From his roots shall bear fruit. We see in Isaiah 53, but it's not what it, it's not what Israel expected. It was a suffering savior. It was a sacrificial savior. The Messiah they expected, the Lion of Judah they expected, was a king. Jesus came first, not as a king. He came as a suffering savior. He came for you and I to provide provision for sin. And he was like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. Israel appeared to be dead, but then there came a savior. There has come a savior. Now in Revelation, he is and will be soon King of kings and Lord of lords. Jeremiah 23 gives us that glimpse that Israel missed in, in Isaiah 53. The days are coming. That's what they expected. When I'll raise up for David a righteous branch and he shall reign as king. That's what they expected. That's what they wanted. That's what they hoped for when Jesus came. Not understanding that there was a sin problem that all of humanity had and a savior needed to be provided jesus was that perfect sacrifice romans chapter 15 says jesus will be king he'll have a kingdom he will rise he will rule not just jews not just israel not just an israeli kingdom not just a jewish kingdom but a worldwide kingdom it will involve all peoples jew and gentile alike but not only is he a root from david he is the root of david how significant is that this is the very thing that the Pharisees couldn't answer. Jesus stumped them with this reality, and they quit asking him questions after this. Matthew chapter 22. How is it then that David, in the Spirit, right, in the Spirit of God, wrote, calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? There is a beautiful picture there of the father speaking to the son. David has, a, has, has an understanding here of the plurality of the Godhead. One God, three persons. Um, and what we see here is this. Jesus makes this direct connection to this passage here in Psalm. And what's being communicated very clearly is this. Is that Jesus came after David. Okay, But he also predated David as well. Micah chapter 5, verse 2 shows us with clarity. Bethlehem, too small to, be, to have significance in the tribe of Judah. But this prophecy is given to Bethlehem. You, from you, Judah, shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel. That's forward-looking. When Jesus came, he didn't fulfill that yet. Revelation 5 and forward, he is now fulfilling that. But that verse ends with, with the other side of the coin. Who's coming forth, this ruler, is from of old, from ancient days. We get a picture there of Jesus not only being a king who will come, we get a picture of Jesus being deity who has been God eternal from, from everlasting to everlasting. Before David, after a, a David. Before Abraham was, I am. John said very clearly and showed us. So we see this reality Jesus Christ is the root of David. He came after David, but David came from him, from his creation, from his handiwork, from all that he did. Jesus is worthy. How can we not see that when we look at the scripture here and see the beauty of the truth of the word of God?
prophecy is being fulfilled. Jesus, who is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And let's go back to that passage specifically now. And let's just look at that. We are in Genesis chapter 49, verses 8 through 12. Jesus is the root of David, yes, but he is also the lion of the tribe of Judah. As such, he will be praised by all mankind. We see a glimpse of that in the prophecy that's given here in Genesis 49. Jacob says to Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. As they bow down before Joseph, they will before Judah. In this sense, from Judah will come the king of Israel. David was of the line of Judah. Solomon, ultimately Jesus Christ. The nation bowed down before this king. All the sons of Israel would bow down before David, before Solomon. And ultimately, not only all the 12 tribes of Israel, but all peoples will bow down before Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 2 makes that clear. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow before him. All people, saved and unsaved, will in a moment in time all bow before him, who ultimately is the Lion of Judah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He is, he is worthy of worship. He is King of Kings. He is Lord of Lords. We will honor him and bow down before him. As king, he will destroy his enemies. That's what a king does ultimately. A king consolidates his kingdom. Jesus Christ will consolidate his kingdom for all eternity. Sin will be eradicated. Genesis chapter 49 again, verses 8 and 9. Judah, your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. That's a very kingly phrase. Kings had dominion over their enemies. They conquered their enemies. And they became king of conquered lands, expanded their territory, their empire, etc. Your father's son shall bow down. Here we have this picture of, of Judah as a lion in his prey. Jesus fulfills this ultimately. That's what he's going to do here in Revelation. That's what's going to come out of Revelation 4 and 5. The application of this is going to come up in chapter 6 to follow. The judgment, the wrath of God, of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. 1 Corinthians 15, and then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when Jesus delivers the kingdom, after destroying, he will destroy every rule and every authority and every power. He will destroy all enemies completely. Psalm chapter 2, verse 9, we were in Psalm chapter 2, verse 8. As the Father speaks to the Son, You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. As the, as the Lion of Judah, not only will we all bow down to Him, not only will He conquer His enemies, but He will reign forever. His kingdom won't be temporary. It won't be just for a period of time. It won't, won't even be just for a millennium, a thousand years. It will be eternal. Genesis chapter 49, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Why? Because Jesus is from the tribe of Judah, even though he has been from everlasting to everlasting. Through Mary and Joseph, he was of the line of Judah. He will reign eternal. That line will never be broken in Jesus Christ, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute, till Shiloh comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of all the peoples. The word Shiloh there, it can speak to a place. Shiloh was significant. But it speaks more, I believe, to a person, that being Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And it's leading to a time, ultimately, to a national prosperity. We're going to see that. And so we see the royal line. We see the, we see the Judah is going to be the line of kings for Israel and ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That's what we see here in Revelation chapter 5 and in chapter 19 and to follow. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. Chapter, 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 16. Your house, David, and your kingdom, David, shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. It means David's going to live forever? No, he's already passed away. His bones are in the ground. You will, he's going to be complete and whole with the Lord. It is Jesus Christ that ultimately is being spoken of here. He will be the one who will rule and fulfill this prophecy. Revelation chapter 15. What's written here as is this last trumpet is blown, leading to the final judgments. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. It is, it is going to be eternal prosperity. There are, there's a lot that can be said about this, these verses here. 
the, the finishing, the fulfillment, the last piece of this prophecy to Judah. They will bind his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. There's a lot of applications that, that people want to bring into this verse. We could spend a lot of time here. One ties this episode to Jesus Christ riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. Um, his humility there. Um, the garments in wine and the vesture in the blood of grapes is tied to the imagery we see in Revelation of conquering of Jesus Christ in Genesis and in, in Revelation 19 where he comes and he has scarlet on his robe and, or, the, or the blood of the cross and all those things might tie in in some way but, but the con contextually it seems more because what's being spoken of here ultimately is the kingly line of Judah the way God is blessing Judah and what we have here I believe is a picture of God's blessing on Judah and ultimately on that eternal kingdom Jew and Gentile he will bind his foal to the vine no one does that to bind a donkey to the vine is to is to invite the donkey to pull, to ultimately rip that vine apart with his strength. And uh, yet the vines here are going to be, there's going to be such strength within the kingdom of God that can't take place. Not only that, you don't put a donkey on on a, on a vineyard because the, the donkey is going to eat all the produce and eat all the things. And, and yet what's being communicated here is there's so much abundance, so much produce, so much blessing, so much riches that that this is commonplace and acceptable and okay. To wash your garments in it means that there is, there, is, there is such an abundant abundance of wealth. There is such an abundance of grapes and what that means and the riches that it brings that we can wash our garments even, even in, in the grape, the juices of the grape, of the vine. I think the picture here speaks to the prosperity that God's going to bring, ultimately to us. The riches, the spiritual riches that are ours in Jesus Christ in the heavenly places. The riches for all eternity. The riches of blessing that will be ours. Um, beyond comprehension. Um, and so what we see here this morning is, is simply the Lord is worthy. Jesus Christ is worthy. He's one with the Father. He's fulfilling and fulfilled the will of the Father. He is ultimately... The King of kings and Lord of lords of the tribe of Judah. He is the root of David, eternal, has always existed, always will be. He is everlasting. He is all these things. We see Jesus Christ here, and um, we're going to see him very specifically next week as we, open up, as we open up this chapter. He will step into the scene in person, but he's already here. He's already in the pages of what's being written here. And he has overcome. He's overcome. Verse 5. And he has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. We're going to see that next week. We're going to develop that next week. What's that look like? How did he do that? Right now, just an appropriate ending is simply this from Psalm 103. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord. All his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul. Appropriate response. The Father to the Son is one of worship. Will you, do you, do I, will I, will I simply treasure, will we treasure God in our life? Will we worship him? Bow down before him. Praise him. Will our soul be connected, knitted together with the Father through Jesus Christ? Let's come back next week. Let's look at what that really means, how Jesus Christ did overcome, what that means for you and I, what that means for, for justice and for judgment and for the kingdom coming forward. What does all that mean? We're going to see that next week. Thank you for joining with us, and we invite you to come back next week.